I translate from Polish into English. I'm a British translator based in London. And from the perspective of a British translator, my feeling is that I translate into English, therefore, for the entire English-speaking world, plus anybody who wants to read my translation in English. Therefore, I want my work to be available here, there, and everywhere. And so I'm very happy when... I work for a publisher, either a British one or an American one, who is prepared to sell their work, the work on, to a publisher on the other side of the Atlantic, and, um, or who has very good distribution on the other side of the Atlantic. And the good point here is that as a translator, you can be active in this process. You can help them. If you have a book coming out with a publisher in one country, they may not necessarily have all the contacts that you have in the other country. And you can even talk to them about it and suggest who they might contact on the other side of the Atlantic. So that's something a translator can do to help make sure that their work is available everywhere. Then another thing is that from a British perspective, the fees offered in the US can sometimes seem a lot less and the conditions in the contracts can often seem a lot less attractive. For instance, uh, in America, you can't have so-called moral rights, which means that technically the publisher may have the last word on your text and could change things in it. And through various experiences, I have found that although that may be in the small print, you can talk to these people and negotiate with them and tell them, what I really want is this. And on the whole, they will say, yes, okay, we respect the fact that you know what this text should say. And when you go through the editing process, they won't just roll, steamroller over your work, but will actually consult with you. So again, that's something a translator can do, is negotiate the contract properly. Likewise with the fee, it's not always that bad if you make the effort to negotiate. Um, and, need, and you need to, a good way to understand the conditions in the US, if you're British, is to talk to American translators. Make friends the other side of the water and find out from them how it works. So I would heavily encourage as much contact as possible um, and then the third thing I wanted to say is that sometimes people translating for a publisher in one country rather than another feel that there's a kind of language problem with British and American English. I say get over it. Everyone watches American films, I mean movies, and you know what they, they're saying in those and you never worry about it and you never make a fuss saying oh, I can't go and see the latest Tom Hanks film because he's talking American and it's the same with literature you, British people don't read American books expecting the publisher to have changed all the spelling or put in words that you know changing diapers to nappies or whatever and um, I don't really think it's such a big deal and people shouldn't worry quite so much about British versus American English. Obviously, your book needs to be consistent, um, but it's, it's not the end of the world. Thank you. Thank you, Antonia. Susan, would you tell us a little bit about your perspective on things as a translator as well? OK. Um, hi, my name is Susan Bernofsky. I teach literary translation at Columbia University, but I'm here primarily in my role as chair of the Penn American Center's Translation Committee, which is one of the two translator organizations in the United States. Uh, the two literary translator organizations, I should say, in the United States. There are many more organizations for other sorts of translators. And to follow up on what Antonia was saying, um, I thought when I saw that I was on this panel, I would bring a copy of a book that I had translated for an American publisher that was reprinted by Portobello <laughs> here, Visitation by Jenny Arpenbeck, to, to point out all the changes that the publisher had made to Britishize the book. And in fact, there are none, um, not a single one. Spellings, American spellings. So you've got my American words here, in, in <laughs> published by Portobello Granta. Um, so what does that say? Um, 
I am so envious of translators who live in the UK right now because you have such wonderful translator organizations that I have been able to admire while I was here. We're a little short of them in the United States. What we have is, on the one hand, the American Literary Translators Association, which is on the model of an academic organization. It has a yearly conference and doesn't do too much beyond, beyond the yearly con, con, conference right now and is not really in the position to be a, an, a translation advocate organization. It, you know, it doesn't really do anything for translator training or for translator funding, grant giving. It is a good place for translators to come together once a year and talk about translation, which is always good. Um, I do learn things at, at, at the yearly conference. We have also the, um, the translation committee of the Pan American Center, which does much more different sorts of of activities. For one thing, we are able to give grants to support upcoming translators through the Penn Translation Fund. This is because a single donor, a literary translator, in fact, Michael Henry Heim, came to Penn and said, I would like to donate a large amount of money that I have inherited and use that to support the work of younger translators. Um, so the Penn Translation Fund came to live at the Pan American Center. And every year, um, we are able to fund approximately 11 translation projects um, to the tune of approximately $3,000 book length projects. Um, the wonderful thing about these grants is that you do not have to ever have published a translation to receive one. It is, you can, you know, arrive with you know, your bare talent and an idea and a 15-page sample and receive a grant that gets you a lot of attention from publishers. Pub we have a lot of publishers paying attention to the books, the projects selected on, on these lists and many of these projects find publishers through this. Now, I understand that the ability of translators to apply directly for funding is one way in which the United States translators are ahead of the game vis-a-vis -vis our, our UK colleagues. Um, there are these grants you can apply for. The National Endowment for the Arts also has a bi-yearly competition for translation grants, which are much larger. They are $12,500 to support a book-length project. And they often go to translators who are already established. But you can also, as a, as a new translator, apply for and, and receive one of these grants. Theoretically, for a larger book, one can apply for $25,000 grants, but they are almost never given. Generally, projects are, are funded at the $12,500 level which, as Ira Silverberg, who would have been on this panel but couldn't, um, was telling me the other day, you know, they've really decided that if at all possible they want to give grants at the $12,500 amount so that they can give more of them because the, the amount of the pool of money they, they can give out every year is fixed. So do you give the, the amount of money, do you give larger sums to fewer people or, you know, smaller sums which are still considerable. $12,500 is, you know, what a translator might expect to receive as, as an advance for a novel. You know, that's, it's quite, it's already quite a respectable sum. So they give that to more people often. Um, what else do I wanted to say? Um, we also have publishers applying for subventions for translations for the various cultural institutes. And I assume that's, that's similar here. And I think we can talk about it. Oh, one issue that, um, I've learned is is is, I guess we're 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 a little ahead on on, on the the U.S. side is that um, having your name on the front cover of a book is something that translators regularly regularly push for and with often with success, and I'm I'm told that it's not done here. Um, I did have in my contract with Portobello that my name would appear on the cover of the book, and it, the book came out and my name is on the back cover, which I was told is after all the cover. Um, but the idea is that a, a well-established translator who's known to be good brings added value to the book. And so, yes? The, re the reviewer gets it. The reviewer is on the cover. The reviewer's name is on the front cover. <laughs> my name is on the back cover. Michael Faber. <laughs> 
Is he very famous? Michel Fabier is Michel, Michel Faber is very famous. Okay, <laughs> so he's helping to sell this book for Portobello. I'm very glad if the book is selling well. And they made a beautiful cover. Look what a pretty cover it is. Um, but but the, uh, it's a matter of uh, sort of the translator being understood not as a individual um, behind the scenes worker like the typesetter or you know the person who you know made, made the advertising contract but somebody who's made a significant substantial artistic contribution to the book and you, you what you want is a reading public that says oh yes I admire the translations of so and so and if I see that a, that this author I never heard of was translated by so and so I might well take a look at that book as well okay that's enough for starters I think that's great. Thank you very much. Welcome, Esther Allen, translator extraordinaire and translator activist, really. Um, Kate Griffin, would you like to tell us a little bit about your perspective? Yeah, my name's Kate Griffin, and I'm in International Program Director at the British Centre for Literary Translation, working with Daniel Hahn, our National Program Director. Um, the day before London Book Fair, um, we five and various other um, UK, US people involved in translation had what we called a, a UK-US summit meeting, um, basically to talk about the, the situation for translation in both countries. Um, for me, that was, uh, well, I learned a lot from it. Um, I was particularly struck by um, what it reminded me of uh, about the situation here in the UK, which is how after the... After, um, over the past few years, uh, the translation organizations here have been working increasingly closely together. Um, I mean, this Literary Translation Center here is an example of that, and how we've really been sort of building up the infrastructure. Um, and so it will be interesting to look at how we can work with uh, US organizations and what we can learn and what good practice we can share in exchange. Um, since we're all interested in translation into English of languages and literatures, particularly um, those that are underrepresented in English, which is most of the world. Um, one of the things, one of the examples, I suppose, of the, ex you know, the sharing good practice um, was a, a project that we carried out last year with the Avon Foundation. Um, at BCLT, we're particularly interested in the links between translation and creative writing. Um, we are based at the University of East Anglia and work closely with the MA in creative writing there. Um, but for years, Michael Henry Heim, the US translator, had been w uh, developing a way of teaching translation that uh, used creative writing at its base. Um, and so we, uh, he was going to come and teach uh, a course for us at the Avon Foundation. It was the first year that the Avon Foundation, which runs short courses of creative writing, had run a course in literary translation. In the end, he wasn't able to come, but before he did, he um, did a Skype training session with Maureen Freely to go through his methodology and, base and share it with her so that she was able to run that course with Sasha Dugdale. Um, the, and it's, uh, it, the course went very well. We hope to run it again with the Avon Foundation. So that's just a small example of how we can share um, methodologies and interests. M as I said, my job, dis my job title is International Program Director, and I take the international part of that very seriously um, and work very closely with partners in a wide range of countries around the world. Um, China, Japan, um, the Arab world, Indonesia, India, um, and we're working in Brazil as well. Um, basically what we're doing is looking to work with partners to develop courses, often the BCLT summer school um, transmutes into an autumn school in India or a winter school in Qatar, and we look at developing skills of translators and building up networks of translators um, and finding out about the translation situation in those countries and looking at how we can um, encourage translation from those languages and literatures into English. But this is all taking place in the country itself and what I'm interested in is how we bring that back to the UK but not just to the UK, also to the US, to Australia, to how we get that literature um, that is often now being translated and published in the country. I mean, just thinking in India of Seagull books, who translate and publish amazing uh, books in translation, but also in Singapore, I've been hearing about a, 
publisher who translates a Chinese author into English, but it's published in Singapore. How do we get to read it here? How do we get to read it in the US? Um, so this kind of how we can work together on this wider flow of literature and translation is another area I'm interested in. Fantastic. Esther, would you like to give us a five-minute, your, your most, if you could have three priorities, um, sort of agenda items for what you think would be most valuable in terms of creating cooperation between translators into English around the world, um, how we might begin to get that to happen. I'm very sorry for not being Ira Silverberg. <laughs> <laughs> Ira's much more fun than I am. <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to channel my inner Ira and you know, say really provocative, funny things. Um, Just curse uh, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, yesterday on the panel with Ira, he said, stupid, evil, and lazy. <laughs> um, there, there, I just said those three words. I have channeled Ira. Uh, one thing that has really struck me here, there's two things that have really struck me here in the UK. Um, number one, the absolutely fantastic energy around translation that is exemplified by the group of people that have crowded this room at every single event I have seen, um, which is quite extraordinary to me. The fact that you're all here and so interested and there have been so many people walking around the fair, I see more people at this center than I do in most other places. And the people at this center are kind of quite clearly here because of real interest as opposed to because of my boss told me I had to go to the digital rights management presentation at 10 a.m., you know, whereas there's like a, a certain air of dullness in some of the other booths. Um, so that's incredibly exciting. And I think as an American, what I envy is the, the degree of centralization that a country like England has. Um, you, can, you, can ha you can get together and do things um, and, and of course, in the United States, there are all sorts of things going on, but they're very far flung from each other. And it's very hard to create the kind of solidarity and energy among different institutions that has so clearly been created between English Pen, the Translators Association, the British Center for Literary Translation. I mean, I think Susan and I scratch our heads and try and figure out how we could do that. What would be the basis for our working with that? But I think the thing that really needs to bring all translators who are translating into English together was catalyzed in my mind by uh, an exhibit at the British Council, um, which I really recommend everybody go and take a look at, um, because I was deeply shocked by it. And it gave me an example of how things really are very different here than they are in the United States. Um, it's, it's called the English Effect. And the entire lobby of the British Council is about how Eng English is one of Britain's you know, major global assets. And corporations all over the world, including Nokia, Renault, uh, all sorts of other major corporations are having their entire staff speak in English. Uh, you know, English, two billion people are learning English and it's growing. English is the source of power. English is the source of economic benefit. And these things are all true. Um, there's no question about that. I mean, that's the pattern of globalization that we've seen for the last 30 years. But there was absolutely nothing that I could see in the exhibit. And admittedly, I was strolling around, and there were a lot of people in the room. There was one little thing about how English people in the UK learn second languages at a much lower rate, which clearly was tied in with the fact that this is a very global language. Um, and it's true in the United States as well. But other than that, I couldn't see anything about translation. Um, and the fact of the matter is, is, is that if we f present, uh, you know, this sort of notion of English as the global path to economic success uh, imposed on any kind of corporation that has any am ambition to multinational success on all their employees. So there, apparently in the Renault com factory, you have native French speakers conversing with each other in English because it's mandated by the corporation. I mean, and this, I knew this is happening in Japan. I know it's happening elsewhere in the world. And, and people resent it and hate it, um, quite naturally, as we would resent it and hate it. Um, but, you know, it's the way forward, it's the way up. Um, so I think that I've been talking a lot about the concept of polyglossia, uh, which is of course a old, I'm an academic, so I use a word like polyglossia, please forgive me. Um, 
Uh, it's from the Russian formalist Bakhtin, who made a very simple and very profound point about literature that I think remains very true, which is that literature and, and artistic culture in general is at its richest when there's many different languages that are circulating in a single space. And the fact of the matter is that we live in places like that. We live in London, we live in New York. There are many different languages being spoken by all of these people uh, as we walk past them in the street. But if our literary culture doesn't reflect that, if our, culture, if our corporate culture increasingly ceases to reflect that, scientific culture stopped reflecting that decades ago, all scientific articles are written in English, um, you know, what's going to happen to that poly, that polyglossia? Um, so I think what we all need to be doing is creating space within English for all of those different languages um, as much as we can and, uh, you know, and transforming the way that people talk about English. I mean, I, it, and it was funny because I think if the U.S. government were to put up an exhibit about the English language as an asset to the U.S. government in the United States, there'd be riots. There would be riots because we have a very, very strong Spanish-speaking minority that is on a political path of ascent, and um, they would rightly view that as a mischaracterization of what is, in fact, even if it doesn't acknowledge it all that much, a, a polylingual country. So that was a really interesting uh, moment where I said, wow, we speak the same language, and it's equally effective you know as a tool of you know global dominance for both of us but we can represent that we we have very different ways of representing that thank you wonderful so uh, one of the most um i think useful events that i ever attended um for translation was the first international translation day at which Srila Ghosh, who then ran the free words center said we're not leaving this room until we have some actual action points, things that we can do um, that will make a difference, that we can change the, the way things are now for the better and, and address some of these issues. Um, and that's something that I would also like to attempt to do today. Um, I'm taking notes. Um, and we'll, we will continue this conversation, that we, this summit that we started, that Kate referred to. Um, and what I would like to do now is open up to the audience and hear from you um, challenges that you may have faced or, more importantly, um, ideas that you may have for how translators on both sides of the Atlantic and in Australia, anyone who's working translating into English, can collaborate, India. and India, thank you, um, can collaborate to address some of the really major issues that we will all be facing. I was last night at a dinner with a tra um, publisher from Spanish who is explaining to me now, in Spain, one of the major publishing houses is actually translating the e-books into English in-house, and that the translations are dire in some cases, but they're, they're not being vetted by any native English speakers at all. And then these go out into the, the ether and in a sense can be the death of an author. But they said most of the authors, if they don't speak English well enough, they, they won't know. Um, and in some cases, just care that it's in English at all. Um, so this is one example of, of what we're looking at, the landscape in the future of how if we were to collaborate um, as, as a group of, of Eng translators into English, that we would have more power um, and ability to raise a voice that could have an impact. Um, so with that, I would like to ask for the microphone. Uh, wonderful. So we have a microphone. Do I have a brave volunteer to start off um, and suggest steps we might take or, or challenges that you personally have faced? No one. Here we go. Can you? And if you can just introduce yourself first, um, what language you translate from as well. My name is Rachel McNichol. I'm based in Dublin, Ireland, and I translate from German to English. And really, I have a question. That's why I'm so brave. <laughs> uh, the, um, and it, but it's also a challenge, a problem that the 
most of the translation funding that's available is, um, you know, the gatekeepers of it are publishers. So I was delighted to hear that the, there is a translation fund in the US where the translator can apply. Um, and um, first of all, I wanted to know, is that translation fund only open to US residents? The pen, the pen translation fund? Not to my knowledge, because I applied this, this year. OK. Read the know. fine print. It's possible that I missed something. No, it's definitely open to anyone translating into English. It's not open to people who are translating from English into other languages, but anyone translating into English can apply. Well, that's really good to know. And then, um, so the next challenge, I suppose, is to try and say, well, you know, is it possible to uh, set up other translation funds on this side of the Atlantic that are open to translation projects that aren't that, you know, or uh, another problem is, you know, that if you want to go and work in a translator's residence, those again seem to be always dependent on you having a contract with a publisher before you can get to go to the translator's residence. So a lot of the work that, that we are, are doing in many, well, a lot of the German ones seem to be Switzerland, Germany, Austria, you have to have, um, uh, in most cases, you have to have a contract. Leidig House, I don't think you do. Yeah. I think you could apply for Leidig House in the United States. I don't think they require a contract. Okay, I was I was think, talking of the ones, uh, say, if you want to go to the, the Loren in, in Germany or, or the, uh, in Switzerland, sorry, or Strelen or any of these. You, mo most of the ones I've looked up where I want to go and, uh, you know, immerse yourself in the language and the culture as well as working on a project. Um, rather than staying in an English language country <coughs> to do that. They are, seem to be tied to having a contract mm -hmm. already yeah. for, a, for a book yes. with the publishers. So the, again, the, gate, the publishers are the gatekeeper of you working on a project. Um, so, and that, I think, would be good to, to look at. You know, it, are there ways of facilitating translators to work on projects you know, that are in the making? They don't yet have a publisher. They don't yet have a contract, or yeah. they're working on it. You're absolutely right, and I think I would like to have this conversation at English Pen as well, which has recently set up a fund that's quite similar to the Heim Translation Fund, um, but differently from the Heim Fund, does not allow the translator to apply independently. And it, it seems to me that the translator is as valuable, if, if not more valuable, as a source of potential um, literature and, and successful, co even commercially successful literature than a publisher can be for many different reasons, and we don't have to go into that. But I think that is something that, that could change and, and probably should change in this country, that, um, that the UK funding powers that be would begin to recognize the translator as um, a legitimate source of great projects and, and recognize that by funding directly rather than funding through the, the publisher. Because then you're always looking at it through this somebody's lens of commercial viability, which does not great literature make. Um, so I completely agree with you, Rachel. And we will try to do that. Thanks. My name is Lauren Schimmel, and I translate from Spanish into English. But um, just talking about Germany, one thing that I know is um, I think it's the Bosch Foundation or the Bosch Company, the you know, foundation. the foundation. Yeah. Um, they do a lot of things where they'll have, let's say, German French translators, and they'll. Um, I don't think that they do that though into English. And so I wonder whether there's ways to do coalitions. Um, yeah, I mean, in this case, it's in it's a company that's using some of their money to fund cultural projects. Um, and but they have an annual thing where they, uh, they did it also with Spanish translators from German into Spanish, and so they they brought um, you know a dozen uh, German Spanish translators to Germany to meet. Um, I don't know whether it was with a specific author, but to to sort of collectively um, do that. And I don't know whether there's a way for various you know maybe the English pen and American pen to work together with some other entities to do an Anglo-American uh, you know from one language into English with other national, um, I mean, especially since there's a lot of, uh, you know, like, I was surprised there's very little Latin American presence here, even though, you know, like Argentina has a very strong 
um, Spanish English translation program that has funds right now um, through publishers, but uh, Mexico also has a, an open call right now. So, um, you know, there's a lot of countries that are actively interested. Brazil is, is doing a lot of work in, in, in that. So I don't know whether there's a way to maybe try and get, you know, specific languages into English working together that way. Mm-hmm. You know, th- there are some other existing programs, like in Banff, Canada, the the, Biltzi, the the Banff International Literary Translation Center, every summer, you know, will brings together groups of translators to work to work on their projects and have seminars with each other, and it's international. And there's the possibility of having your author also invited to to work with you during that period. And I know for for German, there's also, um, you know, at the at, at the um, Literatures Colloquium Berlin. Every summer, there's a summer academy, Zoba Academy, that brings together groups of translators with local Berlin authors. I think each specific language has such such things. I think I I love the idea of having the two pens get together and do something like that. It would the, the hard part about that would be finding a sponsor for it because it's very expensive. I mean, you know, in. like you know, let's say Renault, you know, and you could have French into English translators and they would sponsor it, you know, which is what the Bosch, you know, and it's sort of one of the things where probably. From an institutional perspective, it's easier to make that alliance than not. Uh, so, just a possible idea. Yesterday, in a conversation, somebody, uh, I think this was my idea, I'm almost ashamed for it. We were talking about the role of translators as the um, sort of secretly sexy partners in the. Um, in the book production process, you know, the work is underpins everything, you know, like like underwear. So why not get Victoria's Secret to um, sponsor a program? I might. Yeah, I mean, at the BCLT Summer School, we work from a range of languages into English. Um, that funding tends to come from the cultural institutes, and we are working this year with the National Library of Brazil, who are funding our Portuguese workshop, working with the Brazilian author. Um, But what we're trying to introduce more and more are travel bursaries so that um, translators from outside the UK, even as far afield as the US, can also attend the summer school. So yeah, it would be good to look for, to carry on that search for other sources of funding to allow us to do that. And I want to add too, in in the translator summit that's unofficially been going on for the last two days here, some of the some of the the, the, the fantasy <laughs> ideas that were floating, thinking, you know, how can we shape this? How can we fund this? How can we make this happen? Was number one set up in the United States a translators association that would do some of the things that are not done at the moment by the translators associations, which is you know have regular you know translation workshops and training programs, um, have you know a, a more organized way of you know organizing publisher subsidies for for translation, have more translation grants, um, but also some sort of international umbrella organization that can really cover all the literary translators. You know that's. You know, we need we, we, we really ought to have that, but you know, how are we gonna put together, who's gonna run it, where's it gonna be? I, if anyone has ideas about that, <laughs> tell us too. Well we're all taking notes up here. As you see we're all taking notes up here. We actually um, was it the World Translation Federation, <laughs> WTF. <laughs> <laughs> that was Samantha's contribution. <laughs> Um, so, uh, other thoughts, comments from the audience uh, about, we have one hand up over here. Can we get a mic there, please? Hi, my name is Delia Morris, and I'm a bit of an anomaly. I'm British, but I'm also French, and I live in France, and I translate from French into English and English into French, and I've got projects both ways at the moment. But I wanted to give you a little bit of an idea. It strikes me in all the things that I've come to here, translation hasn't got the same, or literary translation hasn't got the same professional status as it has in France, where it's really well organized, fairly well channeled. You do have to fight to get a contract, but there would be nothing about a translator's name on the back cover. That is not possible. You yourself as a translator and the publisher would offer it to you from the beginning. You you know, you're brought up not to be a fool. Translation is also integrated into the educational system. There are too many MAs in literary translation. That's my opinion. 
um, because if they don't get the right number of students, they can't run Albanian, for instance. There, have to be, there has to be a minimum of five students. But there's an overall Centre National du Livre, and that's the big thing I wanted to talk about. They brought a book out um, two years ago on all aspects of literary translation. They are the people who give the grants to the publishers. They got lots of statistics together, which translators had had the most money from them so that they're looking to give it to others now. They were pulling their own socks up. Two, they listed prizes available, residences available. Um, they, they, they really have got sort of feelers out and are willing to help and are willing to help publishers too. And it seems to me that what we've been doing in a lot of the talks these last three days, it just isn't as professionally high up the scale here as it is there. If you belong to one of the two translators organizations, you are well protected and you do have a lot of bases to go on, including a contract. I wouldn't dream of not having my name on a cover and certainly not on the title page if I had to negotiate in order to keep the work. Can I ask you where the funding for that uh, Centre National Deliverer comes from? Well, I would think that it's government linked. I don't know, but it's a really solid institution. Um, the and government here is less likely to be quite so sympathetic, I suspect. Yes, but why? It just spent £10 million on something else, after all. Yeah. Yes, I'm, I'm not talking about now. It exists yes. for quite a long time, but <laughs> yes. the book came it's out about thing. two years ago. And, and, I mean, there is a directeur régional du livre, uh -huh. France being divided into regions. Each region, which includes several equivalent of counties, has a directeur du livre who looks after all these things. I mean, I actually got an interview with one of them to say, I want to be a translator, what do I do? And he was really kind and helpful. It's a whole different way of looking at the thing and somebody has stood up earlier than we need to do here, uh, I think, and said more loudly, something has to be done to pull us all together and to professionalize what is a profession recognized by publishers and translators, but not by everyone else. If I could just respond to that, I was actually on a panel at the Société des Gens de Lettres when they published yes. the, the report on translation done by Pierre Assouline. Mm. And it was extremely interesting. I agree with you that as a profession, translation in France is far more consolidated. And certainly when it comes to moral rights and things like oh, that, yes. there's a vast body of legal All precedent protected. that mm. views translation as writing in its own. Uh, um, mm. And uh, the, there's a marvelous woman who teaches at Yale named Alice. Kaplan, who's contributed a great essay about this to yes. a book that Susan and I edited there. I got my book plug in. Good. Um, <laughs> see us um, for flyers. <laughs> yeah, see us for flyers if you're interested. Um, but uh, there is an aspect to that. I think that that happens um, precisely because Renault employees are being forced to speak English on the factory floor. In other words, uh, the French government is well aware that if they do not defend and protect their language and their literary oh, culture, absolutely. there will be, I mean, there's an attaché culturel du livre in New York, and I've been yes. working with the attaché culturel du livre in yeah. New York for a long time. Um, the British, I mean, the, you know, the American government does not need to put somebody in a, in a consulate in Paris to make sure that, you know, uh, Stephen King gets translated into French. Um, and at which brings us to the next point, which is that, uh, you know, French translators can make a living and there is much more translation there. But if you look at the actual figures, the vast majority of it is crap. It's airport bestsellers uh, written in English. Um, so, uh, you know, this is a real problem for these many, many translation mm -hmm. schools that are, uh, that have grown up in France, and it was a big topic at the oh, Société yeah. des gens de lettres, it, because everybody's problem. translating from English into French. Well, well, and, you know... No, no, it's been stated publicly. I went to a seminar where it was said, we are training too many. 
Yeah, no, it, it, that was said two years ago. Yeah. Um, there, there's too many people doing English, and it's it, you know, and we need to do other languages. But at the same time, are, you know. the universities are closing the other language oh, departments yeah. except for English. Because the idea is they're if not you getting learn, enough takers. If you know French and you know English, you'll be able to travel the world. So why learn German? Why learn Russian? Why learn long traditions of mm -hmm. cultural interaction mm -hmm. between languages are just simply. You know, the, the, the university posts are being closed, the departments are being closed, the training isn't being offered, it's not viewed as necessary, it's not practical, it's not efficient. So, yes, we can it's envy the viable. French translators, but in this, in, and also in another way, they're another part of the same problem that, you know, and, and the very fact that they're able to make their living, they are able to make their living because they're translating vast amounts of stuff in many cases. Well, they're translating European stuff in yeah. many cases. Yeah. Yes. They, they're going to Brussels or Strasbourg. Yeah. But they actually do, I think, um, run probably not correctly lead people into believing they'll get a job when they've done their course. Right. And that is simply not <laughs> true. Well, it's more true in France than it would be here. I mean, there are lots okay. of people in yes. France who do have jobs as translators, who yes. are making a living yeah. as translators. Mm -hmm. So. While the mic is traveling, I'll just add that as much um, progress as could be made in the UK, I think there's even more progress that could be made in the US. For example, the Translators Association here, which offers the service of vetting a contract for any member of the association, it is not available to American translators at all. There's no organization providing that service, which probably should be uh, somehow. I don't know how it would happen, which one, but... Um, well, there actually is an organization, the, the Authors Guild. If, I mean, if any of you work with American publishers, you can join the Authors Guild, which is very receptive to being joined by translations, and they will vet your contract for you. And it's not expensive to join. It's, I think, it's $75 a year, it's, which is really pretty fantastic when you consider that they will go through your American contract for you. They gave Susan and I lots of advice about our book. <laughs> And, uh, and the, the Penn Translation, the uh, Penn American Center Translation Committee does have a model contract up on the website, which is not the same as having your individual contract vetted, but it has recommended terms that you can um, look at for, you know, at least to, to get a, a ballpark sense of what you should be looking for. It does not, however, contain suggested fees because of um, fears of lawsuit um, under monopoly laws. There's a, a history where the, the American Translators Association, which is not specific to literary translators, but general translation, including literature in the US, did have recommended fees published. And there was a lawsuit. We're forced to, to take it down. And since then, no translators organization in the US publishes recommended fees. We use the British Translators Association piece. <laughs> and, I, and, when, and when I get asked if anyone, if anyone asks me, I say, I'm not allowed to tell you, but if I were allowed to tell you, I might suggest 15 cents a word. <laughs> OK, yes. I, I, I wanted to, to follow on from that. You know, Given that um, the, the UK and to a much greater extent the United States are notoriously stingy when it comes to, to cultural spending, um, and, and given the, the and I'm, I'm just you know, coming off of what we were talking about before, about how much money there is that comes from the cultural agencies in specific countries, and the degree to which, you know, in the current climate, all of these cultural agencies are really in trouble in terms of funding. Um, to, and given that literary translation is in a process of professionalization, where there is a lot of support that's needed, and there's a lot of funding that's needed, um, to what extent are there funding opportunities, not just for individual translators, but for translation programs and for, you know, literary translation centers and things like this. To what extent are there funds for that potentially in, in you know, from foundations, from the private sector, from non-government sources that might be a little bit steadier um, in, you know, in, in the present economic circumstances? Can you just introduce yourself? Oh, yeah, sorry. My name's Sean Bai. I'm, uh, I translate from Polish into English. I think that there's probably potential in the United States that we have not yet tapped and that no one has quite gotten organized to go about tapping, you know. I'm, maybe if we were to make a very good proposal and go to the Lannan Foundation, you know, Patrick Lannan might discover that there is some, some money. There, there, there is a lot of money in the United States and somehow the translation 
organizations have traditionally not been so successful in, in finding it, but that doesn't mean it cannot be found. Um, we, we're, we're short on public funding. You know, the, 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 the literature budget for the entire National Endowment for the Arts for the entire United States, which is a pretty big country, is three to three and a half million dollars a year, which spread across all literary endeavors across the entire United States just doesn't go that far. Um, I was just thinking of the example of the Nippon Foundation, which is a foundation based in Japan. And um, they've been running this Read Japan program. And we, BCLT is now in the fourth year of what's likely to be a five-year agreement with them, which has basically enabled us to incorporate translation from Japanese into English into all aspects of our program, from the summer school to our mentoring scheme. We're offering master classes, working with publishers, working with Words Without Borders. It's a very holistic approach, and it's a very generous you know, program of support from them. Um, I don't know how many other foundations there are out there who have both the resources and you know, the imagination to fund such a broad program. Um, but just picking up on the point that you're making, I think one of the things that we need to do is kind of learn the language of other funders and other foundations. Um, we're very good at talking about the value of translation within the sector to each other, but it's how you kind of articulate the value of what we do and why books should be translated, why we need to read books from around the world to funders who have different priorities, but who, if we kind of press the, the right buttons, you know, talk about our matrix for change, that kind of thing, you know, learn to answer those sort of questions, um, that, yeah, there may be more potential out there. Um, I, I, you brought up the name of Michael Henry Heim, who uh, was not only a genius translator, but at the end of his life turned out to have been the funder of the Penn Translation Fund. And he had an idea uh, about a week before he died. I had a very intense two-hour phone conversation with him where he essentially made me take notes and send it back to him and all the things that he wanted for the future. And he had an idea that he'd been pursuing for years, um, which is modeled on the music industry, which has ASCAP where successful music, you know, people who have a successful record in the music industry can donate a small percentage of that to a fund that sort of protects musicians. And he said that writers in English who make so much money from the world sales of their work, um, you know, J.K. Rowling, Stephen King, people who are making millions and millions of dollars every year from translation, translated sales, therefore from the work of translators, should be encouraged to donate a small percentage of that money. Um, and a movement could be started um, where you just made it clear to these people that, you know, a small a fund was set up, small percentage of that money donated, and that money would would support translation from other languages into English. Um, I think it's a brilliant idea. I have never even remotely found a tiny way of beginning to consider how I would implement it. Um, but I throw it out there. Uh, well, in Poland, actually, pe anybody can donate 1% of their income tax to a charity. Um, but that's an, a, a different point. I wanted to say that um, all this is making me think and have a vision uh, whereby I would like to be sitting here perhaps 10 years from now telling you all about the great Warsaw-based FSO General Motors Fund for <laughs> Polish <laughs> literature and or the, you know, some bank that's invested in Poland and I think this has gone dead, I'm not sure, oh no. Um, and how there may be now that Poland is doing comparatively well economically while the rest of us flounder. Um, and that has happened as a result of a vast amount of investment, mainly in the banking sector and the car industry. Now's the time to go and bang on the door of all those happy car manufacturers and say, how about a little bit of that profit? So thank you. You've started my cogs turning. <laughs> yes. Other ways of promoting translated books, I also run a small poetry press called the Midsummer Night's Press, and for instance, um, we're publishing in the fall five female poets um, in English, and one of them is from Slovenia, and we were actually turned down from the Ministry of Culture for support for the actual translation, but the Trubar Foundation pays half of the printing costs. So that's another way, though, of funding or making a project possible that, you know, because we're getting support on the 
printing side of things, we can then afford to pay for the translation ourselves. Um, so that's other ways that um, you know translators can either look for or be aware of these sorts of supports. I know other countries do have this to to print uh, national literatures in other languages. So, can we get the mic up here in the front row, please? I don't want to be depressing, but I will be depressing just for a moment, and then I'll try and be undepressing at the oh end. Oh my God, it's Amanda Hopkinson. Yeah. Oh, that's <laughs> <good. Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> um, we tried. In the 90s, we really, really tried. Um, initially, Graham Fawcett and I, we tried to get the publishers, first of all, to cough up, because uh, we thought that if we had a fund that publishers paid into, particularly those publishers that exported so many translation rights and translated books, um, they could donate a percentage and we could use that fund exactly as described. It was a total disaster. At the end of the day, I think two years work, a book written, a program devised, I got, God knows how much more working hours, mainly sponsored by the Gulbenkian, just the research. Uh, we had two publishers signed up um, and pledged only to commit a few thousand pounds each if everybody else did. Um, so forget that. J.K. Rowling, I don't want to slag her off just because I hate Harry Potter. <laughs> I don't hate her personally, I just don't like her books. Um, but I think we all know that um, translators alone have had a lot of problems in getting paid decently for translating Harry Potter. And uh, she seemed to have come down personally, according to one conference I attended in Paris, against um, equal pay for equal work for our translators around the world. In other words, if you lived in a poorer country, you can still get paid next to nothing. Um, but of course, the um, markets may be big, and um, particularly in Southeast Asia, and the publisher can stand to make an enormous amount of money from it. And um, the last idea was that maybe we should do it the other way around. And if we thought in Britain, I don't know how it works in the States, of an institution like the ALCS, the Authors Licensing and Copyright Society. Uh, they already administrate all kinds of, well, as you'd expect, rights and recoveries for authors and also for literary estates, for descendants of authors, um, to recover um, monies, for example, from reproduction of um, literary works. Well, this is reproduction in another way. So by extension, it might be interesting to talk to them as a possible clearinghouse to try and reestablish this. And at the moment, I think rather than target the givers, and in Britain we're much less philanthropic than in the United States, but even in the United States it doesn't seem as though, with the incredibly laudable exception of uh, Michael Henry Heim, that uh, there are people queuing up to donate. I think maybe if we start with one association and then try and talk to wealthy authors being translated, wealthy publishers profiting by translation, and to other associations that might be connected. We could perhaps look at it that way around. I'd certainly be interested in doing so. I, th I think that it's very good for us to not think about ourselves as asking for charity, but instead presenting our work as a prestige item. You know, a foundation should be so fortunate as to have, you know, international literature and the work of fine translators as a something they could show as as you know as showing their own worth you know because we're adding we're adding to international exchange international you know understanding and enriching our own local cultures and i think positioning ourselves in terms of what we bring in terms of value is is crucial in this conversation I think it's a great note to end on too, because cultural diplomacy in the world that we live in today is, is ever more vital. And I'd like all of you, if you would like to continue the conversation on the Words Without Borders blog so that there's a, a vehicle for us to continue the discussion um, and continue to bat around ideas of what can be done um, with the idea of, of working together and, and hopefully making more of an impact as, as we move forward. So thank you all for coming today. It was wonderful. Thank you to our fantastic four panelists.